and uh, working in the German department, and would I be interest, interested in meeting him? So I uh, went for coffee with Marcus Oberlum here, uh, and uh, he uh, has phenomenal credentials coming from Wien, studied in Wien, Vienna, sorry, uh, and uh, both theater, opera, and clowning in his background, um, training at the University of Vienna and the School of Philippe uh, Gaulier uh, in Paris and at New York University. And he's also worked with a number of, of very famous German stage directors in opera and theater. Um, he's founder, if I am correct here, of the uh, first Austrian fringe uh, opera company that um, has directed productions in many European cities and also conducted workshops all around the world, including at a number of um, uh, universities in the United States. So I don't want to take time uh, away from his time by reading off the many, many credits, but Marcus, thank you very much for agreeing to come here and do this very brief introduction to Commedia dell'Arte. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm uh, the Max Kader visiting uh, scholar in the German department and in my real life I'm opera director. So uh, I, I'm really happy to, to, to have uh, two hours now <coughs> with you to, to undertake the, the impossible uh, to, to get you to know about the Comedia dell'arte, which is one of my uh, hobbies which turned out to be a very important part. Uh, of my life. I've been writing a book, uh, in German though, <laughs> uh, uh, which, uh, which is a link between the uh, history of theater, theater sciences, but also the very practical part, because I'm working since my 18th uh, year of my life uh, in Cometa dell'Arte with masks on, and, uh, and so it, uh, I developed a big experience in that. Why am I bothering you with this Comedia dell'Arte? You are decent <laughs> opera singers with hopefully a huge career in front of you. Why? Why? Because, as we say, the Comedia dell'Arte is la mamma mm -hmm. of the whole entire European theater. And what is European means also concerning opera. Uh, because there was no, no border between dramatic theater, opera theater, whatsoever. And I will tell you uh, now, tonight, we have two hours, and I will give you a very short introduction about one hour. Be free to, to write down, jot notes, whatever, about the comedy that I do theoretically, and then uh, in one hour, which is completely crazy because I usually I don't even start if I don't have two months of you. Um, we will start uh, to, to jump into it. Uh, I brought two friends of mine, and uh, in the second hour we are going to, uh, to work with them uh, practically in the, uh, to the, to, to the Korean But. How did it start? You know, uh, in the Middle Ages, the times were still very safe. Everybody knew what was going on. Every star in the sky had its place, it was glued there, and everybody knew where the stars were, everybody knew where God is living. And you look at the and the Gothic cathedrals, they look like that. No doubt where God is living. And then things happened, like a guy in Spain said, I want to go to India, but I don't live towards the east, I live towards the west. Because I say, the earth is a ball, it's round. And everyone said, you're crazy. You know, if you want to go to New York, you go that way, you don't go that way. And uh, so it was a completely uh, uh, revolutionary thought. And everything which seemed so clear suddenly turned upside down. And uh, 
the, the, the conception of how we see the world was completely dormant. And then the, the direction of our thinking and looking slowly went down. And then we started to, to watch what's going on here. And this is already the Baroque church. You, you know the round churches of the Baroque uh, turning into a circle. The view of the human beings was led to the other human beings. And we said, oh gee, how is she looking like? She looks different than this other woman. And when I'm a painter, I say not, uh, I, I'm going to paint woman, 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 an icon of a woman, but I, 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 I start to paint the individual because I want to, to, to evaluate this individual. And then I say, oh, the light is very strange here. She has a shadow in her face, and so I, I paint the shadow. And she's completely different than, than somebody else. And, and this, uh, this created an urge to express uh, the individual. Of course, we had to invent a new color. So the painter were, were uh, experimenting with colors. And suddenly, yes, of course, the oil color was invented. But who invented the oil color? We know it's Van Dyck, it was 1517, and his first painting is, uh, is Eva, um, uh, Eve in the Cathedral of Ghent. We all know that. But who invented the oil, oil color? It was the time. The time made it possible that Mr. Van Dyck invented the oil color. It, it was the huge wave of human, of human development, of cultural achievement to make this happen. And as this happens, uh, so many other things happened in philosophy. It was the individualism. It was also the rebellion against the church. This wasn't for free. This meant millions, not millions, but thousands of dead people. This was called reformation also. To, to say, we don't obey to one god. We don't obey to one emperor. This was revolution. And um, to make it short, short, we only have one hour, it's crazy. Um, there, there was one city in Europe, which was especially important, out of many reasons. And I tell you, this city is called, still called, I don't know how long, still, but still called Venezia, before it's drowned <laughs> in the sea. And Venice was very, very important. Why? Because it was the most important harbor in Europe. So every, every, uh, commercial exchange with the Middle East uh, went over Venice. If you want to have something red, like the, the, the lady in the first row, you know how difficult it was in that time to, to dye uh, a cloth in red. How did you do that? You, you, you needed snails, the purple snails. A poor bush snake, pur 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 purple snails. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but they were very expensive, and they lived in the Middle East. So it was a, a huge, huge thing to have a red dress. Until today, a red dress is something special. Look at the cardinals, the Catholic cardinals. They are clad in red. Why? Mm. So so uh, Venice was very important. And there were, uh, there were people in Venice who made a lot of money uh, in trading. The Merchant of Venice. Maybe you know that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not an accident. And uh, you had uh, people in Venice. Why, why in Venice? Because it was a harbor. It was international. It was a mixture of culture. There were influences of people coming from all over the world. And there was a lot of work. 
you could find work where, where, where there's so much traffic going on. You find work, you can work as a servant, you can uh, load and unload the goods uh, of, the, of the cargo ships. And um, you had a lot of opportunities. Plus, it was a republic. They were strong enough of being a republic. So they, they were not linked. I mean, you know that Italy hadn't existed. Italy was found in 1861. So up, up until then, it was a bunch of, uh, of small um, countries and, and, and kingdoms, not even kingdoms, but, uh, but uh, there, were, there, there were counts and uh, 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 reigning in their, in their, in their, in their, in their small, small countries. And the unification of Italy was also very much linked to opera, as we know. So, so everything uh, is linked together, but in that time, when we talk about the 16th century, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, Venice as a republic, which was very, very outstanding, because it meant freedom. It meant freedom for many, many people. So we had the people who came from North Africa, mostly, or peasants from, from, uh, from Bergamo, from Mantua. They came to, to, to Venice because they could earn much more money uh, working in Venice than, than guarding their sheep uh, in, the, in, the, in the mountains around Ferrara. And um, then uh, we had also uh, people and that's, that's also for you very important. Do you know what a courtesan is? The courtesans? What, what, what is a courtesan? And please, always interrupt me. If you want to ask something, interrupt. Interrupt, interrupt, yeah? A courtesan is basically the second born daughter of an average family. Why is this? If you have a daughter and she wants to get married, you have to pay a dot. And most families could afford only one dot for one daughter. So if you have two daughters, that's a big problem. What can she do? She cannot get married because you cannot pay the dot. She cannot become a, a nun because the Catholic Church also demanded a dot. So what could she do? She could work to wash clothes and so on. To, uh, everything you do today in the household in pushing a button meant hours of work per day to heat, to cook. You had to cut wood before you make fire to heat, uh, to heat the, the, the water until it boils and so on. So, so there were many, mostly women, who had a lot of work with keeping a household going. Uh, but also there were courtesans working as a prostitute. Some of them are also courtesans working for priests and doing the household for priests. And it's a very interesting thing, uh, because um, uh, I don't know whether you know Michel de Montaigne. He was a French philosopher, also in the 16th century, and he made a, a trip from, from Paris to Switzerland and Italy, and he wrote a diary about that. If you, if you want to read his essays, it's wonderful. It's really wonderful. Uh, Michel de Montaigne. And uh, he wrote that the most interesting people he met in his entire journey were the courtesans in Rome. And he was very angry because he had to pay them, although he didn't make love to them, but he, he talked to them. And, uh, and he said they were the most uh, uh, interesting women. There was a pope who was called Leo X, and he said, that in the holy city of Rome, there must not be courtesans, because most of the courtesans are prostitutes, and in the holy city, there must not be uh, prostitutes. And the consequence was dreadful, because the, uh, he gave them like, like one month to leave the city. And what happened is that these women had to sell everything they had, and more than 300 women had been murdered in the suburbs of Rome, 
by by uh, by uh, rabbis because they knew that the, the the women come with a lot of money and being alone. Uh, and uh, after more than 300 courtesans died, the Pope had to pull back his order. Then he said that the courtesans uh, who work for priests should not be paid anymore. When he said that, only in Venice, 25,000 women were on the street courtesans. 25,000, I don't know whether you have been to Venice. Now this is about the people who live in Venice. Before there were 250,000 people living in Venice, <laughs> very packed. And, uh, and now uh, only in Venice 25,000 women protested against uh, this order of the Pope until he had to pull that back too. So the courtesans are very, very important uh, people uh, socially because th these were very, very strong, intelligent women who knew everything. And they knew about men, they knew about life, they knew exactly what they want to achieve in life, what is important, what is not important, and they knew exactly if somebody is telling bullshit or not. <laughs> and um, so, so these are important women, uh, many of them in Venice. Who else came to Venice? The, the doctors from Bologna. Bologna is the first university in the world. So if you had a doctorate of Bologna, it's like you would say Harvard Rutgers. You know? So everybody's fainting when you when you say that. So the people came from Bologna and they they, they, they were very uh, proud of, 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 uh, of being there and, and uh, uh, try to impress the people. Um, what else is is going to is, is important in that time? something I forgot to say. What we call Italy, let's call it Italy. It hasn't been Italy, we know. But the South, Sicily, uh, had been occupied, and Umbria had been occupied by the Spanish. And the North, the Normandy, had also been occupied by the Spanish. So the Spanish were sitting in the North and in the South. Uh, keeping uh, Italy between the two, two hands. And of course, the Italians hated the Spanish, as everybody hates foreign soldiers in the country. Okay, but what we have to know is that meanwhile, the Spanish were sitting in the Lombardy. Um, in Europe, there was a horrible war going on. We talked already about the Reformation. There was a religious war, and he, he lasted 30 years. It was a 30 years war. And uh, the Austrians fought against the French, and the Germans, and the Spanish, and the Czech. And everybody knew exactly where God was living, and where he was not living. And they were, they were killing each other. But you have to say something. And, uh, Parenthesis, I have to say that in 30 years of war, in that time between uh, 1618 and 1648, until the, the, the Peace of, of, of Worms, uh, you know how many people died in actually fighting? Not more than seven to 8,000 people died in 30 years of war. When you take the year 1917, only one year, and only the front between France and Germany going 30 kilometers forth and back, one million children died. I'm sorry I said children, boys of 17, 18 years old. They went, one million died because of 30 kilometers back and forth in one year. In the 30 years war, like seven to 8,000 people in fighting. Of course, there were people dying from, from famines and, and, and diseases and so on. It was a horrible war. Why do I say that now? Because the Spanish were sitting in Lombardy. What does it mean? That the Austrians had so much to do with the Swedish, with the French, and the French had so much to do with the, with the, 
Netherlands and so on. Uh, they, do, they didn't want to open a front in the south. And what happened is that in Italy, what we can call Italy, uh, something could develop very nicely, which is called the Italian Renaissance, Rinascimento. And uh, so until today, we, we have everything, uh, every uh, uh, term in, in bank, it's a credit, it's a silo, it's brutto, it's netto, everything uh, of the modern life is, is being born in Italy. Um, who else came to Venice? You know, if you are the son or the daughter of a, of a noble, of the, of the Count of Mantua, and you want to have a love affair, what do you do? If you are in Mantua and you have a love affair, and you are the, 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 the princess or the prince of Mantua, everybody knows in a second. <laughs> so you go to the vibrant Venice, to the, to the anonymous port, to the harbor, where all these people are, 250,000 people packed in these narrow streets, you can have any love affair you want. Nobody would know back home. So you find a lot of noble people also saying, oh, ah, I'm not from Padua, I'm, I'm from Mantua, I'm, no, I'm from Ferrara, I'm from Parma. You know, all these people were, were claiming to be somebody else, of course, to stay anonymous. Yeah? And here you see something which is very obvious. We have a very small city, we have a lot of people, and we have a lot of different people, a lot of, of foreigners, in the sense that they are, they, are, they are come to the city to find their bliss, and their happiness, and their luck, and their fortune. And this is really important. When many people live in a, in a defined space, there are conflicts. And when there are conflicts, you need stories. People need stories. And you know what happened in the, in the Renaissance. There was a huge uh, uh, blooming of the Arab culture in the 13th and 14th century. What, what happened there, that uh, uh, the, after the, the burning of the, of the library of Alexandria, uh, 90 after Christ, everybody thought that, that everything is lost. All the, 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 the antique writings had been lost. But there, there were writings having been translated into Farsi and into Arab. They have survived in the, in the, in the library of Ninive. And Ninive burned too. But, uh, but in the, uh, there's always this pendula between Europe and the Middle East, which goes back and forth, and now it's coming back the, with the Syrian refugees. There will be a pendula going to the, to the other direction too. The monotheism came to Europe. It's always coming back and forth. And so these, 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 uh, these uh, antique uh, writings had been rediscovered, retranslated into Latin and ancient Greek. And all the nobles in Europe found an entire new universe which was fascinating for them. Why? Because they could identify so well with the Greek gods. And the Greek gods were like them. They were decadent. They didn't have anything to care about but their, their love lives. They are the, the gossip, who, which goddess is doing something with which god and why not and how. <laughs> and they were immortal. That was something that the, 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 uh, the, the noble people could not achieve. But the, the Greek gods were idols because they were immortal. So in the, in the courts of these counts and whatever, they performed the, the Greek and Latin Place, and uh, the people drowned uh, into into their into their um, into this world of, of the antiques. But in the streets, 
in the streets of Venice, the real life went on. You had the, the workers, you had the courtesans, you had the, 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 the Spanish soldiers who say they are great, you have the, the doctors of Bologna, you had the, the merchants, everybody. And everybody tried to make the best for him. And this meant conflict. And these conflicts needed stories. And so that was the urge of the Commedia de Arte. And I tell you something. Whoever is telling you something about the Commedia de Arte tells more about himself than about the Commedia de Arte. Why is this? Because everything is true. When you say, ah, oh, the Commedia del Arte, isn't that this theater thing, this tradition where they built 67 theaters only in Venice to be performed? Yeah, yes, yes, that's right. And then, no, no, but the Commedia del Arte, that, that's what, what the people, the, the, the families, when they were pulling their, 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 their carriages throughout Europe and they were, they were performing that on the streets, one day to the other, that's Commedia del Arte. That's true. And then, no, 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 no. The Commedia del Arte, uh, isn't that what, what Moliere did in the court of the Rue Gatox, the, 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 Louis the, the 14th, the, the, the Sun King in France? And uh, in front of the noble people. That's true. So everything what you say about the Commedia de Lat is true because there are thousands and thousands of people making their living from performing. And this is the revolution, ladies and gentlemen. This is the revolution. It was the first professional theater in the world. And when you want to become professional, your origin is there. I held in my hands the first theater contract, which is still alive from 1529, where uh, some people gathered together at the, at the Notario in, in Padova, saying that they want to perform for two years together in the street, and they made it exact rule who has the, the cashier uh, and who has the as the key to the, to the, to the cash box <laughs> and so on. And they made exactly which rule, what happens when an actor becomes ill, will he be paid and so on, 1592. So, and there are many, many different theories how the, the Comedia del Arte was, uh, came to life. Also, how it is linked to the Carnevale di Venezia, which is also a very important point. Because the Carnival, what does it mean? Everybody like us, we want to disguise as a king, as a hero. I'm a Schwarzenegger, you know, obviously. <laughs> and uh, so everybody wants to be something he's not. And every princess wants to be a beggar. So we twist around, we turn around in Carnevale. What does it mean, Carnevale? Goodbye meat. Yeah. This is what happens before the Carême, the, 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 how do you say it? Lent? Yeah. yeah the, the time where, where you must not eat in front of uh, before Easter? Yeah. 40 days. You, you, and, uh, um, so, so you, it was a, a, a cleaning process for society that once in a year you could turn around the hierarchy, you could do things which were forbidden, and uh, the, they, they constructed a puppet which they named the, 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 the king of carnival, and they accused him for everything which went wrong last year. Oh, I, can't, I got a bad grade, and there's a famine, and we don't want to And, and they, he was guilty for everything, and finally he was burned. He was sentenced to death, <laughs> death and burned. And this was the cleaning of everything bad happened in the year before. So it was a very, very strong impact of the people. Plus, they were disguised. Plus, they could, uh, uh, they could do things uh, with, without fearing the consequence, socially. But, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one truth how the committed that really started to exist, and I, I will tell you the truth. 
because I invented it. <laughs> um, on behalf. <laughs> you know, uh, there, there was a huge tradition in Europe of storytellers. Like you have today in Mali with the Creole priests, they go from village to village and they, they, they tell their stories and they see and they it. it's, it's amazing. In Lamba, by the other language. Uh, in, in Russia, the Ministry of Singers, they were very important going from village to village, telling stories from village to village. And, and then the, the, the Tsar Alexander invited them to the, uh, to the Kremlin and killed them all because uh, it, was a, it was a trap. Uh, because he knew how important he was, uh, they were to, 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 to transfer also things which are not good. So there was a huge, uh, or in, in Tehran, I was working a lot in, in, in Iran, in, in their tea houses with, with paintings on the walls, and there come storytellers inside and tell stories in Farsi. They tell stories uh, relating to the, to, to the paintings on the wall. Or in China, you have the, the storytellers tell having the, the kind of, of blind. They have a blind going down, the, the, you have a, a, a picture, then they tell the story, then they put the other blind down, and then they, and they, and they go to the next village. And this is what happened also in Italy. And so we are in, in the year 1517, in a small village close to Bergamo. And this is, this is the, I tell you, this is the only truth. Uh, uh, a storyteller comes, and he tells his story in the main square of this small village close to Bergamo. And one thing was different to all the other days he did that. A young peasant was present, and he made stupid remarks on the story, and the people started to laugh. <laughs> and like like me in high school, I'm sorry to say, uh, I made all my te teachers mad. Um, so so they started to laugh, and and the teacher or oh, the storyteller, sorry, became more and more angry, and they. And he became more and more angry. And the, and the peasant wouldn't stop. He would, he would uh, continue. And the more angry the, the storyteller got, the more he was inspired to continue. And how long do you think the storyteller was angry? Until he went to, to get the money. <laughs> And then he found out that he got four times more money than usual. And then he went to the peasant and said, you know what? I engage you from, from today. We travel together. I get three thirds and oh, no, I get three three fourths and you get one third. So so you get you get I get three fourths and you get one fourth. And the guy said yes. And this was the birth of the Comédie de l'Art. <laughs> and you see, first, everything is, is related to money. And the money is not just uh, distributed. It's not, it's not uh, justly distributed. And these are already two main rules of theater. Everything is related to money. And it's not distributed in a just way. <laughs> <laughs> That's why this story is so intelligent. And the, and the, and the third rule, why, why don't I know who is, which is the name of the storyteller and who, what is the exact name of the village and so on? Why? Because I'm stupid. Because I didn't make my research well. Somebody, any idea? It could happen anywhere. Because out of a second, there were hundreds of couples going around saying, I invented it. It was me, <coughs> you know? Of course. So, third rule, all good ideas are imitated right away. And everybody claims to have to invented them. Okay? So, that's, that was happening. So, there were many, many, many couples uh, out of the sudden, they came out like mushrooms. And you had already <laughs> two characters. The one, the storyteller, was the so-called Magnifico. He had a very long coat, 
and she was going like this, without, without uh, moving up and down. So it, it looked very, it was very impressive. Yeah. So it was looked very impressive. And uh, imagine the cool. And um, and and the next, the, the other character, the peasant, was the so-called Zani. And why Zani? It's it's written Z I N N. No, it's Z A N N I. And uh, because he, his name was Jani, but he had a little problem with the, with the pronunciation. But his name <laughs> was the name Zani. And then okay, Zani. So that was his name, Zani. And he had a mask. And the mask, I didn't bring it, but but the mask has very uh, narrow, round eyes and a very, very long nose. So when Zani looks at you straight, he looks stupid. And when he looks from the side, he's aggressive. Stupid and aggressive is a perfect description of a peasant. <laughs> so you see that political correctness was not the thing of the Comédie de l'Art. If you are politically correct, you take away the conflict. But you need the conflict to survive. Okay? So you had the one, the very impressive Magnifico, and you had the Sunny who was jumping like, like, a, like a monkey. How can you make more money? <laughs> Somebody found out if I hire a pretty woman, I make more money. <laughs> that was the birth of the of the of the Kutisa, of the character who is called Kutisa. And so you, we had the Magnifico, we had the Zani, and we had a charming lady. And this was a revolution. Now we come back to 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 to, to the reality. That up until, do you know the Midsummer's Night Dream, ladies and gentlemen? <laughs> this is the best lesson of the theater of history. Why is this? Whatever the craftsmen do in the forest, where everybody laughs, this was the reality in theater until the Comedia de Arte. What, what does it mean? If you want to act, you cannot make a living from it. Why? Because the Catholic Church says you are allowed to act only on the day of, uh, of the holy of the main church in your town. I don't know about New Brunswick. Maybe if you say that. <laughs> yeah, you know, then you, you, you have the, the, the day of St. Paul, or, or in, in Vienna it's St. Stephen's, Stephen's Cathedral. So Stephen is in. 27th of December. So you were allowed to perform on the 27th of December in front of the, of the church only once. So nobody can make a living. So mostly the craftspeople, like in Midsummer's Night Dream, they are making their living of, of being a carpenter whatsoever. And then they perform uh, once a year. Or, or if the king is marrying or something, if, 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 if there's a huge event, you may perform also. You can you, you, you can you can uh, choose a play and then you perform the play. But also, no women on stage. Sorry. Yes. And then came the Comédie de l'Art. They had women on stage, of course. And I I went to the library and I found wonderful Latin uh, pamphlets written by cardinals against what is going on the, on the stages and how they do. And it is interesting, you know what they did? They said, oh, great, great square, beautiful church, let's perform. They go there, uh, perform their thing, take the money, and run. <laughs> and until the police is there, they are in the next village, and they were performing every day, every day, every day. So, they could make a living. Comédie de l'Arte. Yes? So they are the first professional theater in the world. Because these were the first people. And something very important. I don't know if anybody has performed in the streets. 
Hmm. If you perform in the street and you are bad, <laughs> people <laughs> go. No, no, they don't, they don't even care to throw a tomato, it's expensive. <laughs> 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 they, they just leave. No, they just leave. I, I perform so much in the street. Uh, no, they just leave. And when they leave, they don't pay money. And if, if they don't pay money, you don't have money, you can't eat. And if you are hungry, you learn fast. <laughs> so you have to develop rules how how you can make the people stay and how to get them. And this is very important, my dears, and this is so so important for you to understand how this urge of stories became, how the, the dramaturgy of all the opera buffa you did. You know we are going to go to opera now, yeah? But this is so important, my dears. Um, because this urge and these rules uh, is great, because for 350 years, thousands of people made a living, and they cannot be wrong. So everything what we can learn from them is fantastic. Um, Just to, to make a short incap, uh, you know, uh, in the in the 19th century and also starting 18th century, when they built the theaters, like you have the Le Levin Theater there, over there. Yeah. So, <laughs> the first time. Uh, you uh, you know what happens when you go there? I I read the the posters. It's written uh, for faculty, twenty dollars entrance. So I pay in advance, and when I pay in advance, I'm ready to sit there. <laughs> you know? <laughs> if I don't pay in advance, I say, "What's that crap?" And I leave. <laughs> you know? So, uh, so this. The fact of paying in advance made the theater possible as we know it in the 19th century. Ibsen, Strindberg, Chekhov, uh, Schlitzler, they hadn't been possible uh, if the people wouldn't have paid in advance. It, this, this fact of constructing a theater and demanding the, the money in advance changed the whole art, changed the dramaturgy changed our perspective of watching. That's so important to know also. But the, the instinct of conflict, the rules, how a story works, and where's the engine of our conflict, uh, this comes from street And that's so important. Before I explain to you, oops. <laughs> Before I explain to you uh, the, the characters of the comedia, which is very important, uh, I, I just make a small uh, jump to 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 the future, uh, to the to the 17th and 18th century. You know, one of these uh, these uh, these Renaissance uh, dukes uh, was. Um, uh, the Duke of Gonzaga uh, from, from Mantua. And uh, he, he was a, a rich guy in beautiful Mantua. And, and he said to a young composer, oh, it's interesting what you do. Why don't you come to live with, with me in my castle? And uh, then he met on a trip a Dutch painter, a young guy. And uh, said, "Oh, why don't you come? You can stay as long as you want." And he came to Mantua, and then he met a comedian group and said, "Oh, don't you want to come uh, and stay with us?" And they said, "Yes." And Mr. Gonzaga, uh, his his mother was housebroke. That that was a big problem because then he wanted to become emperor. He was killed. That was the end of that. But, but when, when he 
uh, when, he, when he was still alive in, in, in his castle, it was great. The young composer uh, was called Monteverdi, and, uh, and the young painter was called uh, uh, Peter Paul Rubens. Uh, and, uh, and the Comedia de Latte group, they, they were, the, they were the, the, uh, um, the Genosi from Milano. And what happened is that, 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 uh, uh, that uh, Monteverdi uh, fell completely in love with the Colombina of the, of the Comedia de Latte group. And that's how he stopped uh, composing the, the Madrigals but started to compose uh, for solo voices, especially Popea and so on and so on, for, for this woman. And this was more or less the birth of the, uh, of the, of the modern opera. And what happened also is uh, that, that uh, of course, in the courts of the, of the nobles, they were, they were uh, performing operas. Uh, from, from, from the Greek tradition, from the Greek tragedy. Of course, about Orfeo, it's obvious when you, when you write it first for a singer, it's obvious to write about Orfeo. There are more than 300 versions of Orfeo. Or about Dido, La Didone, 256 versions of La Didone. Yeah? And, and there were three acts of the operas. And one act, was 20 minutes. Why was this? Why, why, why was one act 20 minutes? Because the lights, they were not electric, they were candles. And 20 minutes was the length of a burning of a candle. And when the candle was over, it was better to make an intermission anyway. So we had to compose. <laughs> Otherwise, it would be dark. So, so we had to compose uh, operas with uh, with uh, uh, twenty minutes acts. So we had the first act twenty minutes. We had the second act uh, twenty minutes, and we had the third act twenty minutes. And then was something very important. Between the second and the third act, before our hero dies, many people said, "You know what?" We make in the intermission a small story of the Commedia dell'arte, a so called intermezzo, where the people who, who play the, the small parts in the, in the big opera, they, um, uh, they play the main parts in the intermezzo. And what happened then, ladies and gentlemen, we know how our public works, how our audience works. The audience came only to the intermission to the theater. They couldn't care less about the Greek heroes, <laughs> you know, and heroes. They came for the intermission. And then they said, oh, we could do, and the, of course the intermission, the intermission was also 20 minutes, because if you burn a candle, you burn the candle, so finished, you know, 20 minutes. So, and then they made a, a, an intermission of two acts. So you have a first act opera, first act inter, intermezzo, uh, second act opera, second act intermezzo, and third act opera. And 1730, the Teatro San Carlo was constructed in Napoli, in Naples. And this was the first theater in the world constructed only for intermezzi. They say, we, you know, we don't even pretend anymore to produce a, a, <laughs> an antique opera. We just do, we just go for the intermezzo. Opening was with Pecolesi, uh, La Serva Patrona, and so on. It was, and there was something being born, 1730, the so-called Opera Buffa. You might have heard about that. And, and the Opera Buffa was completely uh, born out of the Commedia. And, um, and then there was a, a fight over 100 years between the Opera Buffa and Opera Seria, which comes together happily joined by the Austrian Hugo von Hofmannstein, composed by the German Richard Strauss. <laughs> and uh, in the area of Naxos. 
And this is the, the, the meeting point between the operas area and they wanted to reconcile these two, these two uh, tribes of opera. But, uh, but if you look at the operas of, of Haydn, of Mozart, of Donizetti, of, of Mussini, uh, uh, everything is the same. So what is the same? I'm sorry I talk a lot, huh? but, uh, but uh, it's, it's, in, it's important before we, we jump into it. Uh, we jump into it. But I, I have to tell you uh, about the, the characters. And this is what is the same. I wrote it on, on, this, on this blackboard. I hope you can read it. Uh, we have nine main characters. Of course, I have a list of more than 300, but there are nine main characters of the Cometa de Lata. Most of them we know already. Hanekin is in the lowest hierarchy. I wrote this down in the, in the rule of the hierarchy, and it appears in no, no book unless mine. I got one euro twenty for one copy, I tell you. Um, uh, that's the only book where you, where you can find the relation to hierarchy. And this is so important for us actors. When we are on stage, we need to know my attitude towards the other person on stage. Not, not the other person, but the other character. Sorry. Yeah? But my attitude towards the other character is crucial. So, and my attitude towards the other is defined by my hierarchy. Am I your servant? Am I your father? Am I your boss? Am I the king? Who am I? And I have to know exactly in which hierarchic level I am to know how I can interfere with the other person. Okay? So, Harlequin, we start from the bottom. Why do we start from the bottom, by the way? Ha-ha! <laughs> Why? Because all of you are identified with the lowest people in the story. Do you know Pretty Woman? Everybody is so happy for this wonderful girl that she's married by this millionaire so on, you know? We identify with the, with the lowest. When I tell you, when I tell you, you know, I'm mean, hearing in New Brunswick, it's impossible to find a good cleaning lady. You say, what, what does he want this asshole? <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I tell you, oh, okay, you know what? I found a restaurant for three dollars. You get such okay. a big meal. <laughs> you say, wow, a cool guy. Where, where is this restaurant? You know? So, so you know, you identify always with the lowest. And that's why every playwright in the world who is acting himself or herself, they write for themselves the role of, of the, of the Hanukkins. Shikaneda, you know who Shikaneda was? The guy who wrote the, 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 the Zauberflöte. And he was singing in the world premiere. But which role? Papagino, but he could have sung to Sarastro. He couldn't care less. Everybody hates Sarastro. <laughs> <laughs> and and Sarastro is singing in A uh, in A major, in E major. Everything he's, he's singing is in E major. What does this mean, E major? E major means that all second violins play falls. Because they have been amateurs and E major has four crosses and it's very difficult to play in tune. So everything was he was singing was, was accompanied by, by an orchestra which is false. Because the first violins were professionals and the second not. Okay? So that was a fact. And if, 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 if Mozart wanted to say that he would be a wise guy, then he would lower half a tone to E flat major, because that was the, the score, the, 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 the tune uh, of the Freemasons with the, with the BSS 3 piece. And this was, was wisdom. So he, he knew exactly what he was doing. So E, 
E major, uh, but but uh, but uh, but Chikaneda also wrote uh, for him the 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 Hadeki. Nestroy did, Hamon did, everybody who did Marivo, uh, everybody uh, wrote for themselves the, uh, the the lowest the lowest character. Apart from Molière, Molière wrote for himself uh, the the greedy, the bad, the Monsieur Molon. The, 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 the doctor, um, whatever. I, I, and why was this? Because he was performing in front of the people of the, uh, of the court. So he was in, uh, performing in front of the people and said, yeah, that's true, there's no, no good clinic anymore. You know? And, and so they shared their, their specific prob problems. Yeah. So that's about the, 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 the hierarchy. We have Harikino, and he is the, the lowest. And he's so low, there's nothing below him. So he, he is not afraid of, of dropping because there's nothing to drop to. <laughs> uh, he loves to sleep, especially with women. He loves to eat. He loves uh, to drink. Especially very good wine, which he could never afford. And he is working if he needs to work, but he doesn't really want to to, to exaggerate it. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and Hanekin was was the, the lawyer of all Hanekins in the audience. If Hanekin if I manage to be more witty and more clever than my boss, then all of you are more clever than than uh, than, than your bosses. And, and I can show you that there is the glimpse of a hope of a revolution. That there is a glimpse of a hope that we can, we can change the, the, the social facts. Because I can be stronger for half a second than my boss. And then he has to reconquer his, his position, of course, and I get to hit or whatever. But, uh, but I can show that there is a way out. And that's, uh, and that's important. And also, everything had been improvised. You know, the, the, we knew the story, but, but most of the actors couldn't read or write. So they knew exactly what to do, but, but they didn't know exactly that they were just invented jokes. And what happened then, when I perform in front of the people, and I'm Alekino, one day I do something with my nose, and, and people laugh, and I, 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 I would like, like, like this. These pigs who, 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 who are looking for truffles, and then, then I say one day, okay, now I change my mask that the people they, they should they should see better what I do with my uh, with my nose, and and one day I say I don't act Hanekino anymore, I'm Trufadino, and then I die, and and Trufadino dies too. Unless somebody comes and says, hello, <laughs> and says, uh, there was this actor, couldn't care less what was his name, but he did that with the nose, and his mask looked that, 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 and that. Then Trufadino survives. And I have a list of 300 characters who died with the people, but some of them, of course, survived. And so Anikino has a lot of cousins. Pulcinella is also a very important one. He's the, the, the main character of, of Naples also. Pulcinella is, is called um, a small chicken. And uh, he, was too, he was too weak uh, to come out of his egg. And close to Naples, there's a volcano, which is called Vesuvio. And out of the Vesuvio came the devil to help him to come out of the, of the egg. And where uh, the devil touched Pulcinella, he got a deformation. And uh, mostly a hunchback and a stiff lad. So you know exactly where a hunchback is coming from. And since he is ugly, he has not been loved. And since he has not been loved, he starts to be mean. And he, he, he was mean because he didn't want other people to get the love he didn't get. And also, he, he wanted to find a way to profit, uh, like Iago in Otello, if you want, if 
you know these guys. So, so there are many, many uh, figures in the literature who started to, to invent intrigues uh, to find out how, how you can harm other people and to get your profit or harm them without getting your profit. And this is also everything in level of Haneke, also Bayatso. Uh, Bayatso is also a level of Haneke. Bayatso is a lapai. He it, 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 it was full of straw. And people were, were not sleeping in beds, they were sleeping on straw. That's why he has these big buttons and this thing, you know. This is from, from, from the, the sheets of the of the yeah? Mm -hmm. And, and the Bayazza was a character who always said, ah, I can do it too. And then was falling uh, like, a, like a straw puppet. And, uh, uh, and all of these uh, came out of, of Anakino. And then we have the, uh, we have the female uh, counterpart, which is called uh, Columbine. Uh, and she is the, uh, she's a courtesan. She's a woman with a very, very low social status. And everybody fell in love with her because she's she's a woman who knows exactly uh, everything. She knows everything about men and everything about the world. And she's a very strong, courageous woman, and uh, and very very erotic because she's uh, with her feet on the earth. Yeah. Um, and uh, whereas Amorosa, she's the, the, the noble woman, like Romeo and Juliet, you know. The, they, they exist in all the Vinyang, uh, like in Vitsama's Night Dream. This woman never, never washed dishes, not even by accident. <laughs> she, they, 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 didn't, they, they, they didn't do anything useful. They, 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 they are not able to survive without, without the parents, the, the, the servants. Um, but, but these people know exactly how to, to deal with their lives, how to cope with different problems. And this is a very interesting guy. He is half a step up of Harlequin. He had been Harlequin once, but now he's managed to get one step higher. And he's called Brigella. Brigare in Italiano means like this, making the small deals. Okay? Is it? <laughs> yeah, small, it's like, like a used car setup, you know. <laughs> or is it, you, you, you have to be you have to be careful. <laughs> um, but uh, but but it's very interesting that the two of them uh, are the, from the, the same uh, the same character. They come from from Zani, from 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 Zani. and one thinks he is better than the other. I don't know whether you know Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy. Uh, that's American cultural history. I'm so I'm so surprised that that, that you don't know them. Uh, that's uh, they 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 were really great American movie stars, and they did the transition between the silent movies and the and the and the, uh, and the spoken movies with, with sounds. And uh, and your generation don't know them anymore. It's a homework. You don't watch. Know, you don't know. Oh, yeah. I do. Because my journalism is very It's very, yeah. But, 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 but there are many comic characters where one is a little higher and the, the, the other one is a little lower. And many clowns work like this. That, that, uh, that, that we can... <laughs> <laughs> we, we, can uh, we can paint uh, a fence together, for example. And, uh, and then, of course, I think I know everything better. I said, oh no, please, how could, can we do that? That can be a, a quite funny clown number. But really interesting it becomes only if there is a higher hierarchy, somebody like the dean coming, and I say, David, we have to be fast, it has to be fast because, because the dean is coming. And in the, in the moment we refer to a higher position, then our conflict becomes much more urgent, and this is much more interesting. So that's why these this, this levels, and I don't know whether you know the play Waiting for Godot by Samuel Beckett. The dean doesn't even need to come. Godot never comes. But we, we deal with our conflict because 
we are waiting for Godot. Hey, hey, it's Godot, huh? Sorry. <sighs> yeah. So, so it's it's really it's really uh, important to know uh, how to play with these hierarchies, also with our anxiety. And this, uh, the fact that we are the same, but one of us thinks is more uh, is, is, is is more clever than the other, uh, makes makes it very human and and, and 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 very stupid and very fragile and very like we are. <laughs> and and these are the stories about ourselves. And and that's why uh, these two uh, characters, the Bridgel and the Harlequino, are, are very very important in, in Shakespeare comedies, so in, in Beckett, in in Chekhov, in whatever. Just name it. We have them um, also in opera, but uh, whatever. And then we come to 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 one one level higher. We have three characters, Pantalone, Dottor, and Capitano. Pantalone is the merchant of Venice. He was the rich guy, Scrooge, Scrooge? Scrooge. Oh, you know the, the whole duck? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know. Uh, so so he's, he's uh, the merchant of Venice. He's very, very rich. He's very greedy. And he's madly in love with Colombina, with Columbine. Yeah? And that is his, that's his weak point. So uh, that's how he's got it. And of course, in reality, the merchants of Venice, the real ones, they had their own Comedia dell'arte group. Like today, the millionaires have their football uh, uh, games, uh, football uh, teams and, 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 uh, and horseways teams and so on. And every, every merchant wanted to be the best, to have the best group. And they were paying money, transfer money, like today in soccer. Uh, you have a tiny kino, I pay for you, you come to my group. Oh, I need a good pantalon too, come on here, you know? And, and everybody tried to have the best uh, equipment, uh, the, the, the best team. And then, uh, and then the, the, the merchant looks at them, place and says, how come the poor Pantalone is, is going so badly off in your stories? And he's, he's such a great guy and how can how can he be treated like that by Alekino? And then and then uh, the, 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 the comedian says, listen, that's not you, that's your concurrent. And then he says, okay, go for it. And, uh, and uh, of course everybody made fun about the Pantalone. And, um, one interesting thing is how, cake, how the, the name Pantalone came up. There is one, yeah, uh, there is one honor only one merchant can have in Venice. This was the honor of opening the Carnival di Venezia. And, and when you open the Carnival di Venezia, how do you do that? You have to, to buy a lot of wine which comes out of the fountain of, 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 of Piazza San Marco. That's one thing. But then you open it in, uh, you, you take a stick, and on the top of the stick is the coat of arms of Venice, which is a lion. And you put the stick into the floor of Piazza San Marco. And this, this movement, in Italian, you say, Planta Leone. You, you place the, <laughs> the lion to the, to the San Marco. And when you do this, you need to wear, not a jalapeno, you know this, this red, what we said before, this red, uh, uh, wonderful long uh, coat, magnifico. We, 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 don't, uh, we don't wear this because we cannot put the stick into the floor. So we have to wear something like this, and then we can put the stick into the floor. And from Planta Leone came Pantalone. <laughs> <laughs> and now in all Roman languages, this is called trousers, Pantalone. And the guy is also called Pantalone because he's, of course, the one who gets the big honor to open the Carnival in Venezia. Um, and then we have Totore. Totore is a little like a pig. Uh, he's a, uh, the, the belly directs him to, to, to where he wants to go and he, he, he drinks uh, alcohol and he's very intellectual so usually when he speaks he puts many uh, 
uh, Latin endings on the words, and he tries to be very impressive. And uh, and um, then you have Capitano. Capitano is uh, is uh, the the the, the, the uh, Spanish uh, soldier. We say it's like a dog because it's barking, ruff, ruff, ruff. and when you say ruff, then he disappears. So he's a, uh, he's a big mouth. So he always says uh, whatever he achieves, and then he says, "Oh, I killed the dragon." And, and then I say, "Oh, it's good that you are here because we have a spider in the kitchen. If you could, do. oh, I'm sorry, I have to look for my soldiers." And he always has to look for his soldiers because he doesn't have. So, uh, and, and when one step higher uh, are already the, the, the nobles. And the nobles, they don't wear masks, and they were, they were really the nobles. And uh, they were decadent, and like, I don't know whether you know La Finta Giardinera by Mozart. You only, you only have only the, the, the Amorosi, and you have Sabetta, and you have uh, also the, the Colombine and the Alchino. And so, if, if we talk about opera and Arlecchino, we talk about Pedrillo, we, we talk about Leporello, we talk about Papageno, uh, we talk about Figaro, uh, just name it. It's always the same character with different names, and always the same. Group. And if we talk about Colombina, we talk about Blondian, we talk about Susanna, we talk about, uh, all like Susanna, you know, she says no. I don't, I don't agree. And 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 uh, and uh, the, the the thing is, Beaumarchais, uh, uh, when he wrote Figaro, he went to jail because it's the revolutionary opera. But then I ask you, where is the revolution? At the end of the opera, the count is still the count, and the and, and the Figaro is still the servant. Where is the revolution? They forced him to say sorry, to apologize. And, and this is the, the reason why Pumashe went to jail. And so you can understand how the political system was in absolutism. It's like Putin would say sorry. Or the Chinese for Tibet, oh sorry. You know? <laughs> yeah? So... Um, <laughs> but, but you know, our democracy, this is such a big, big achievement, and it's such a big gift. We should be so grateful, and I say that especially in Europe now. Uh, they, they play with, with the achievements of, of, of freedom, and uh, uh, like that, and it's very serious. And that's what we can learn, and that's why opera is so important now, 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 now. We have all this political uh, 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 dimension of, 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 of the conflicts. Who is the Hanekino today? Who are, who? I mean, New Brunswick, there's a whole, this, this Latino neighborhood. If, if you, I mean, I, I speak a little Spanish, that's great. I mean, I get everything cheaper, you know? It's, it's a Hanekino language here, you know? And, and, that's, and, and, that's so, and that's so important to know where are the Hanekinos, who are the Amorosi today? And uh, I, I, I'm doing this, this committed the Latte bullshit in, in almost uh, in five continents. And I, I've been, uh, I've been to, to, to Korea, I've been to Indonesia, I've been to, to, uh, to Azerbaijan, I've been to Iran, I've been everywhere. And I've never seen people who said, oh, sorry, I, I, we, we don't have that here. We don't, you know? Everybody knew, oh, yeah, of course, Anakin was wrong. So, so these nine characters, oh, I said nine. Who is the ninth character? I forgot. Ninth character is the character, I, why do I, I say always ninth character? Because it, it's it like a jolly joker. If I would say a name, you would be completely uh, blocked with that. But these are the characters who are between the human beings and the gods. So, uh, like Shakespeare, Ariel, for example, Puck, the witches, uh, all, all, the, all the, the, the fairies, uh, all the, the, the magicians, uh, everybody, the, the people uh, who, uh, who are psychic, who tell you this, the future, and so on. 
So if you have a real health problem, you go to a healer, you don't go to, to, a, to a doctor. Right? He, he tells you some Greek words and then you, are, you take something which tastes ugly and you are even sicker afterwards. So, but if you go to a healer who says, oh, I hate you, <laughs> you take it. <laughs> so, whatever. Um, uh, and uh, to give you uh, a, a, a situation with all these characters, let's say everybody is locked into a room, and nobody and nobody knows the, uh, where the key is. Adekino says, "Great, now I have time to sleep." <laughs> where is Columbina? <laughs> uh, Pantalone rushes around. Time is money. Time is money. Open that stupid door. Brigella is imitating him. Yes, yeah, yeah. very good, hypocrite. Yeah, yeah. Time is money. Time is money. Open the door. Yeah. Then, then uh, Dottore is looking in the encyclopedia, key, 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 and tries to find it in the encyclopedia. Um, and the, the Capitano tells the story how he could break out, uh, out of the high security prison. Uh, and um, uh, Amoroso and Amoroso, they don't even notice that the door is closed because they say, Do he love, does he love me, does he love me? <laughs> And, and she, oh, and did, did the letter arrive? <laughs> Where is the letter? And, um, and uh, yes, and, uh, and Columbine, uh, uh, she, she noticed that, that uh, Puccinella stole the key and opened the door. <laughs> so, so she's the one who always solves the problems. She's the one uh, who apologizes at the audience and says, it, done, it cannot work, only men, you know. It's, <laughs> yeah. So, so she's, she's the one um, uh, who who solves the problem. And so these are the nine characters. And it's like in, in Mozart, it's Blondin who solves the problem, and uh, and so on. So, so we uh, we know that. Um, my dears, we have a little time. How are you? <laughs> Maybe there are some questions at this point. Yes, do you have any questions? Mm. I mean, there's so much I didn't say. Usually I talk for four hours. <laughs> so, so these characters here are the main categories, and there are plenty of other characters that kind of fall in or in between the different ones? Yes, yes, absolutely. So there are some characters, you know, who are mixtures between Dottoris and Brigellas and so on. You, you, you find them, you know, you have Scarpino, and, and, and there are so many others, but the nine characters, this is a very, very good basis for you to rely on, especially uh, in operas, in, in theatre. Of course, we can be much more specific than that, but with these nine characters, you are great off. Mm. Yeah. And the, the important thing, really, is the hierarchy. If you if you sing uh, a part in an opera, ask yourself, what is my attitude towards the situation I am in? What is my attitude towards the other characters? That means in which hierarchy I, I find myself. Am I higher than the other? Am I lower than the other? I, am I equal? And, and, and that's, that's very important, and this, is so, so, this helps you so much in acting in, and reacting in a natural way in a situation. You know, this, and, and, and usually, uh, I, I think David will agree, uh, our professional life outside this, 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 this beautiful, safe space here is so tough, and so many bad directors are around, that if you're not especially the big star, they, they don't even have time for you. They, they, they don't even, they, they, they don't care. So when I'm teaching my singers, my actors, my highest goal is to make myself unnecessary. I want to give you as many tools as possible that you don't need a director. If you have one, yes, of course, 
enter through the dialogue, go for it, profit from it. It's great. It's fantastic. You, you can really achieve much more in a dialogue. We don't doubt that. But so often, so often, in good houses too, you can tell names, uh, you find directors who don't know the score, who don't know anything, or who care about special effects, about stage design, about whatever, about press, about yellow press. I see. Yeah? So be ready to do your homework. Be ready to know what can you do to be big on stage. Why is this? The presence of stage, <coughs> this is not a present uh, by God. You know? You, if you know, why am I here? What is my attitude to you? What is my attitude to you? What is, oh, you do this, then I do this. Oh, you do this, then I do this. Then, finally, you, are, you have a presence. And everybody in the audience is saying, wow, this guy, wow, wow, there's something going on. When as I say, ah, oh, you know, there was no director, and now I, I enter on stage because it's written in the score. I don't have a clue what it is. I try to get my pitch and, and the, the F sharp in the next measure. Uh, then, then you leave the stage. Nobody is going to write about you. Because it's the, it's the thought which carries you through the situation. And if you know this precise thought, who am I? What do I do in this, in this situation? What do I want to achieve? What do I want from you? What do I want from you? And so on. That's the homework. If you have a director, a wonderful director, go for it. Work. But, uh, but uh, I, uh, I have a friend who became one of the most famous actors in Austria now. Uh, and he started exactly like that. And one of the characters in the third act of Romeo and Juliet, I don't even know the name of the character, and the director in the big national theater of, of Austria, big national theater, big national theater, <laughs> and, uh, he fell in love with the Juliet and he was completely overwhelmed, a, a band director in the first time, whatever. And it, no, it was a disaster. But this young man, came on stage in the third act, and the newspaper wrote, it was really bad. But go to see, because in the third act, there's a, there's a, a young man who plays an amazing part, where I was really going home to, to double check whether this part was really written into, into the play originally. And it was said, not critic in the biggest paper. And the director of the National Theatre, he reads the paper. So he also gets in and says, all right. And next production, this guy and this young man had the main part. And the rest is history. Now he's one of the biggest actors in, in the country. Because he did it himself. If he would say, oh, you know, uh, he was a bullshit director and he fell in love with Juliet and it was a mess, uh, he can still tell the story in the, in the, in the coffee house. Yeah. Any questions? I'm sorry. I, I'm going to throw around. I'm, I'm curious um, about a couple things. <clears throat> One is um, specific, and that is uh, the character of Don Giovanni, mm -hmm. which of course has had many iterations through uh, through history, and. Uh, Mozart and Aponte kind of had access to all of those previous versions when they were constructing the piece. Um, he himself, I've never been quite clear. I mean, although the piece has many of the aspects uh, that we say derive from Commedia, um, his character is, is very unclear in terms of that. It, you know, what character would, in our uh, comedia, would be sort of the parallel, or maybe there isn't one. Or maybe he's this ninth character that you've talked about. I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> he is a ruthless and a uh, You know? Absolutely. And this is part of the revolution. We, we are in the, in, the, in the period of enlightenment. 
and we are about the justice of society, you know? And also like, like the graph uh, of, of Figaro, the graph of Figaro is a very rare case of an amoroso who falls in love with Columbines, always. Sorry to talk about Figaro for a second, because you will see that the, 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 the graph of Figaro always falls in love to Columbines. And in the first thing that the Barbarian is in Villa, Figaro is helping the graph to get his uh, Rosina, what was it, his name, yeah? And because she's, she's also a Colombina. And then he marries her, so Colombina becomes an Amorosa. But she's bored to death. <laughs> what has she lost is, is an Amorosa in a, in, a, in, in, a, in a castle. So her best friend is Susanna. Who is a, a, a Columbine, so they are very equal in the, in the way. But she's, of course, the, 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 the great thing. And he still is, is running after the Columbines. So he's, uh, he's making uh, Barbarina pregnant, and he's, uh, he's running after Susanna. And uh, so, so, so he, they show the ruthlessness of, of the craft. And to, to, to make it even more funny, we have another cousin of Antichino, which is uh, Petrolino, which is Cherubino. Petrolino came from the children of, uh, of the, of the Comedia de Latte people when they went uh, to the, uh, on the, on, with the carriages. Uh, what do you do when you have, when you have children and you, you act? You have to be on stage. What do you do with the children? You tell them to sit down on the stage because you can so, so, so survey them. You, you, can, you can watch them. You, 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 you are sure that they don't make any, any troubles. So the children fall into uh, the, 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 the sack of, 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 of wheat and they have the white faces and they sit on the stage and look like that. This, this, they, they were the characters where they came, they, they came out of the Pierrot after the death of the Comité de la 1789, after the French Revolution. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and the graph was making fun because, because Petrolino, the child, the Cherubino, has exactly the same desires in the graph. And, and, and Cherubino's even before the graph at the, at, the, at the room of Barbarina and at the Susanna and so on, whatever. And so he was doing, and, and, and Don Giovanni is also an Amoroso who is, uh, who is uh, paying the price uh, for, uh, for letting all these women down. And th that's, the, that's the, the cry for justice of the, of the low people to say we cannot, we cannot accept that, uh, that uh, the lower people, they are ruthless, they, they are without any moral, they are destroying the existence, they, they, he is a murderer. And El Deporello, the, the poor guy, he has to serve them and, and, and he has to do everything to, to, to help him, to cover him up. Uh, and, 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 and then the, the, the Contour, that's a nice character, who says, now, Justice, the day of justice is there. Uh, and uh, and uh, he's, he's trying to help. And but this, this is very uh, uh, this is uh, this is very very revolutionary in in the time. Yeah, I guess for for me it's clear in the uh, Peter mm -hmm. uh, that you explained that I think the the problem that I always had with Dr. Lemon, the problem that mm -hmm. the interesting challenge is uh, the parallelity between Lateralo and Dr. Lemon, who seem and are various signs interchangeable. So you now have the, the noble character uh, and, the, and, um, and the, the servant character at times indistinguishable. I mean, in a certain sense, in theater, it's also the case with the contest and the yes. but, but it's not true, David, uh, because there is always this hierarchy. And in every, every encounter between this, this, these two characters, uh, also when, when, when Leporello thinks that, that he doesn't want to, to serve anymore, that he, he, he's fed up with this guy, 
and that 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 oh, especially after the murder, you know, after the killing, uh, it's uh, uh, this hierarchy plays a big part because Le Borello would leave, but but Le Borello cannot leave because he's dependent financially, and that's. Uh, that's, that's very strong. And I think also, you know, you have to ask the question, uh, acting like the like, why don't I leave? Why do I witness that? Why don't I just say it? No. Why don't I go to the police? What, what, what ties me to this guy? You know? And this is a dependency. This is a hierarchy. And, and many of these conflicts, and it's a very interesting question, because, because I think many of these these conflicts are born out of the social reality of that time. And we have to find out, I mean, not, not, I don't know, let's, let's say anything. What is Harvey Weinstein mm -hmm. as his secretary? You know? When, when does he say, okay, now I, I call the police? Why does he, when, when does he do his next rendezvous in the hotel room? Why? He's a big guy. How can you dare to criticize Harvey Weinstein? You kill your career. You see, and, and this, is, this is a revolution. And now with social media, we, we are strong. We, we down there. Yeah? But, but, but uh, you know, Don Giovanni, this, I mean, in America, there are these big guys. I mean, we, we don't need to say Trump, but, but many rich people and many very influential people, you, you, don't, you don't doubt that. How, how far can they go? And that's a moral question for us, and that's maybe one of the best reasons to do the Giovanni, is how far can, can they go or have they to go until we start to be active to, to say stop? And what can we do? And then we can rely on a man's character. Okay, he will go to hell. <laughs> yes? I shall go to hell. Or shall we call uh, the, the judge and the police? So we have all there. You know? You wanted to ask that there. So this is uh, this is what you were just talking about now. So, just to be clear, at the time, it may sound to Colombia and are probably going to be the ones that are deemed by the populace to be the most morally just. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, in today's world, but like, because of popular media, how um, books, movies sell this idea that, you know, the things that we should be striving for are romantic love, that kind of thing. We argue that popular media is selling this idea of Amorosa and Amorosa, not of other people. It depends uh, on what, uh, what do you want, you know. The, the, they are always um, the peer group of your product. Right. <laughs> right, right. You know, and the peer group of Donald Duck are the, the children. Who is Halekino in Donald Duck? It's, it's Donald Duck. And who is Colombina? For the girls, Daisy. And for the boys, the three nephews. Because they solve the problems. Because we want to sell to girls and boys. You see, it's very obvious. And if you have the, the television series, The Simpsons, that's that. Yes? If you, if you have the television series like Sex in the City or Game of Thrones, you find everything here. Or, or Colombo. Do you know Colombo? Oh, yeah. Especially, why, does he, why, why is he called Colombo? Oh, wow. Because he's the one who's, who, who, who solves the problem. And, and, and also, he shows that he can be better than the millionaire. And also, Colombo is always called to murders in the millionaire. He's the guy with the old car and so on with the with the coat. And then he he he, he solves the the the, 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 the murders among the millionaires. He's never called to drug people or poor people. It's always he's the, the poor guy with the old car and he, he solves the cases of the millionaires. And then at the end he goes back. 
uh, to his own car, to his wife, which uh, who doesn't exist. And also the 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 uh, the, um, the rules, but yeah, I hope we can we can get to them. But but there are very important rules how the scenes are structured and and the economic forms <coughs> was perfectly perfect. And that's why they, they still show that in the Austrian television nowadays. Yeah, so it's very successful. No, you, you find it in television, you find it in Netflix. The media has changed, mm -hmm. but the, the urge of stories is still there. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, we have so many stories, but, but, uh, but in that time, we, we, we were happy to just have some when, when the people were coming and we were running to, to see that. And everybody knew about, because everybody knew the characters, everybody knew the, the masks, the costumes, so everybody knew what was going on in the first time. If you do um, uh, Don Pasquale, for example, look at Don Pasquale, Don Vincenti. Why the hell uh, the poor Don Pasquale is treated so badly? He didn't harm anybody in this story. But 1844, everybody knew, oh, it's a, a pantalone, and that's why he's greedy, blah, 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 blah. Everybody, that was common, this was common sense. And now we have to explain, maybe in the, in the overture, why Don Pasquale is being hated so much. Because there's no clue of it in, in, the, in the special, in the very opera. But since it's, it's, it's a pantalone, we know what the pantalone is. My dears, I have brought two friends. They were patiently waiting. Hmm. That the stages of the Comedia 
They were very, very small. They were uh, four meters times three meters. So very, very small. And they were lifted up. So <clears throat> the, the point why it was important that, that it's small is when you wear a mask, the word mask comes from Spanish. Mas que la cara. More than the face. And when you, uh, when you wear a mask, it's like a magnifying glass you put on, on, the, on, the, on the person. You make much bigger gestures. You make the voice is much, much more powerful. It provokes you and you can uh, surf on the mask like, like a surfer in, uh, in, in Los Angeles. You can, you can really surf uh, on, 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 the, on the power the mask gives you. And when you have nine characters on a very small stage, three uh, times four meters, it's like a bomb. The energy is so strong that they were performing in front of 1,000, 2,000 people without a video wall or amplification, whatever. And people would, would follow very well what's going on because they had such a lot of energy and such a strong energy. Because uh, one very important thing, and that's very important for you for the opera too, every character has a motivation. And the motivation of the character goes until death. And when I say, I want to marry you, and you say, no, I kill myself, or I kill you, <laughs> or whatever. Your husband comes, and he, he's taller than me, then my, my, my fear of your husband is, is, uh, uh, is stronger than, than, than my love to you. Something, <laughs> has, 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 something has to happen, which is very obvious, but my motivation goes until death. And, uh, and you cannot say, oh, okay, then I do something else. And you will not fight Rome and Juliet. When they say, I love Juliet, it's, it's until the death. It's not okay, no, it's difficult, so I, I take somebody else. Nobody would, would tell this story. So it's, it's, the motivation goes very, very, very far until the end. And, uh, and that's very important to know. And everybody plays his motivation. And then it makes, yeah? Don't be uh, gentle. If you make your life, the life difficult for your partner, you are a great partner. If you make your life, the life easy for your partner, you are a very bad partner. Because the problems are your friends. And the, the problems create the story. So don't ignore the problem. Who wants to try? Come. Yeah. Come. 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 Who else? Yes. Oh. Yes. Oh. So which mask? Your pick, buddy. Oh, I don't want to make choice. Decisions. Did someone want to make choice? Yeah. <laughs> you just think. <laughs> All right. <laughs> don't. Overcome. Okay, so we do something now. Uh, what is your name, please? Carl. Carl. Yes. And yours? Helen. 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 Okay. Um, so, Helen, put your mask on, please. You are Alekino. Uh, you see what it makes to you? Yes? Yeah? yeah? And, uh, and Carl, you play the storyteller. First, you step aside, please, and you, you tell what is going on with Harlequino. And give him some directions, but very, very physical things. Okay. He comes home, he opens the door, and so on. But this is not a one-way street. You can do with him something which he has not said, mm -hmm. and you can do something. And then, and then when there is the right moment, Carl is putting the mask of Pantalone and says, Pantalone enters and comes in. When will this be? Carl? Uh, it'll be at the right moment, I'm sure. I'm sure too, but what is the right moment? <laughs> <laughs>
Okay? So, I'm just supposed to start telling a story. Yes. And he's supposed to act. Yes. And then I jump in. And I give you three strikes. <laughs> there's a, there's a, there's a old tradition of the French melodrama. You have uh, three strikes. One strike is uh, actors on stage. Second is actors ready. And third is après la cortina, open of the curtain. Yes? And so it sounds like this. Sometimes the work gets a little bit too tedious. So he uh, has his tendencies to goof off, you know, he'll do whatever else he wants to do. And sometimes he might even, uh, he might even take a nap on the job. I mean, what are the chances that, uh, that his supervisor will come in? <laughs> well, it just so happens on that day that his candidate was coming for a visit. Just coming in to check out all the interns. I hope everything is going all right for the campaign. What is this? What are you doing? How are we going to win this campaign when there's people like you here? I'm going to win this campaign with people like you here. <laughs> what are you saying to me? I just don't know. You kind of. I'm giving you an opportunity. You do nothing. My shirt's tucked in and you're not, so... <laughs> I haven't just an intern, so I don't know. But, uh, looks like you're kind of goofing off here a little bit. I won't stand for such disrespect. I won't stand for this kind of disrespect. <laughs> Fuck your shirt in, sir. I will do nothing about the sword. Fuck your shirt in. You need to get my orders or you're fired. I don't have to listen to this. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> What did we see? Uh, the, the, the Harley Quinn character got caught, you know, doing exactly what he wasn't supposed to do, and then he entered at the absolute worst time for Hillel. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And then we had a very self-assured uh, Alekino. Yes, what do you want to say? Uh, try to like, reorganize the balance of power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But was this credible for us? Yes? <laughs> I think he, he overstepped a much. little bit. <laughs> yeah. I think so too. This, this, this was very, this was, was very effectful, you know, to say, you know what, I mean, like with, with you, we cannot win. And uh, and then uh, his reaction was okay. You're fired. Okay, yeah. which was which was in your power. So you lost your job. Yeah. So this, that was a, a, a victory. Yeah. But uh, how could we transform this that it would be a victory for you? Because I think you could keep sleeping. Yes, but you could say, you know what? I am sleeping because I'm I'm the best intern you have ever had. You know? Yeah. And if you give me more money, then I could give you a very, very good advice how you can win the campaign. But maybe you, you are too greedy for it. Forget it. It's too expensive. Uh, uh, forget it. And then, no, no, give me someone, you know? And then I can say, put your shirt. <laughs> and then you say, oh yeah, wow, you are my assistant now, you know, so, so you, could, yeah. you could be more, um, you know, like, like a card game, you know exactly why to play your card, 
and then to say, you asshole, I hate you, which bitch you food, you know? <laughs> <laughs> then you are hungry, you know? Yeah. So, so uh, this, this is a question. Or is it about the right moment to come? Um, uh, you know, usually moments have a development. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when I'm, for example, when, when I'm a Lekino and I'm uh, in your kitchen and I find a glass of Nutella, do you know Nutella? Oh, yeah. yes. <laughs> you know? So, so I, I, take, I take the Nutella and you tell me when is the right moment. You know, you take the Nutella, I, I open the Nutella, you don't come. I smell the Nutella. Don't come. Okay. <laughs> I put my finger into the, the Nutella and no. <laughs> now you come. So there is no excuse anymore <laughs> why I have the Nutella and I, I am so close to my bliss. <laughs> and then you interfere. That's the right moment. And then I have to find the explanation why I'm the best servant you ever had because I, I have the Nutella in my head, <laughs> or my feet. You see, and, and when you turn this around and then you, you, uh, you manage him to believe that you are the best and you get a, a raise of wage, uh, then, then we, we all won. You know, you, you are our lawyer, so we all won on your, on your account. Yeah? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, what else can we say? We have to know who is leaving the situation. That's very important. That's a, that's a very important rule. Because when, when, when you have the dialogue, then you can talk, 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 and so on. Yeah? But, but when you know you are the one who leaves, it's your responsibility to sense that the energy is down and then you leave. But when you leave, you have to leave behind the problem. You cannot just leave because you need to leave behind the problem because the problem is replacing your energy. It's about energy. Because when I say, oh, Hila, goodbye. And Hila says, oh, okay, goodbye. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I hope somebody comes. You know, and the people start to leave. You know? And when I say, oh, goodbye, Hina. Oh, by the way, I forgot. Uh, you, you are prepared for the first thing tomorrow. The, the, the Mr. Gate from the Met is coming here. And uh, you will see that at 9 o'clock. Five hours, not more. Okay? And then, um, and then you say, oh, shit. I've never heard about this. Who is Mr. Gap? I don't you know. And, um, and, what, 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 who is that? And, and, and then you have the problem, you can make a monologue mm -hmm. in front of the, of the audience and you share your feelings with us, so we feel close to you, you are generous in showing your feelings and, and, uh, and we identify even more with you and we want you to, to win this stupid audition tomorrow morning, for example. So you, you, you see, and, and, and that's how it works. And coming back to Colombo, he said, oh, goodbye. Oh, I have a question. Uh, you said you left your office at 4 o'clock. That's, that's not possible because I was good. But you know why. And goodbye, you know? And, and this millionaire is caught. And instead of, uh, of a monologue, oh, shit, Colombo realized that I was the killer, we don't see that. From the Westerners, we call it cut away to the horse. When it's really exciting, we, 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 we show a horse which is eating grass or something <laughs> to, to rise the, the, the tension. And, uh, and in Colombo, you see an old woman crossing the street. <laughs> and we want to say, no, we want to be here. We want to have the monologue of the horse commission. We want to see what he says. And, and exactly that, that's exactly how Shakespeare works. So I leave behind the problem. And then we have the, the, the monologue who deals with the problem. Mm -hmm. and we share with the audience, and that's that's what we call in opera an aria. That's that's how we deal with our emotion. Yes. Yeah. That's exactly what happens. So you go, you leave behind a problem, and then he sings an aria. <laughs> <laughs> it's easy. It's awesome. Let's try. Just do all those million things. So, 
Hallel is uh, in the forest, and he's a park ranger. He's got to do all sorts of work, checking out what's going on at all the stations. But sometimes he just gets a little distracted. He'll drive off into the countryside, and there's a certain activity that he likes the most of all, and that is to swim the lake. But he doesn't like wearing clothes while he's doing this, of course. So sometimes he'll come to the lake, disrobe, and just go for a swim. <laughs> now, when he comes out of the water, <laughs> just so happens the supervisor is there. <laughs>
Uh, and and certainly I would recommend going to Vienna and experiencing it. And I'm sure uh, your, your uh, company operates there as well as, yeah, so you would have a, an opportunity firsthand if you are in Vienna to see this work. But uh, well, this is fantastic for us to get at least, it triggers off a lot of thoughts. Uh, certainly has for me and I'm sure it has for the students. And you can think about the many operas that you either perform or study and uh, where the uh, comedia characters are in that scheme of things and, uh, and how it all ties together. So this has been a great inspiration for us, I think. And yeah, certainly yeah. Jenny Skiki, which yeah. we're doing, anybody involved with that, uh, we can have a good discussion about that. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Jenny Skiki. And, you know, so many operas are based on these characters, and, and it's so easy to, to do whatever we did very fast with Giovanni with, with Figaro. You, you place the people, and, and you know there are, there are operas where you have five Amorosi and, uh, and, and no Capitano. It's not that in every opera nine, nine different characters. There are, there are operas with two Halekinos, three Halekinos. Uh, everything is possible. And you have just to know who is who and, and put them into these four different hierarchies and you will have so such an easy life uh, to study your, 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 your part in, 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 in dramatic sense. I think, I think probably the closest thing that we have to something like this, except you know where there are actual groups that do this kind of thing, but those are pretty uh, uh, infrequent, I would say. But for instance, in New York, any of the kind of comedy, uh, you know, comedy groups that perform down in Greenwich Village on Saturday and Friday and Saturday nights, you go down and see them. And it's a mixed bag. I mean, some of it is terrible. <laughs> and, and then you'll just hit the one thing that will be phenomenal. So. Uh, yeah, the stand-up comedians are, are the Halekinos because well, we, did, we didn't get too far, but, but usually uh, we don't have the, the storyteller, but only Halekino who comes on stage to tell what, what has happened. And he makes the, the explosion. And he says, you know, since 30 years I'm, I'm working here, but since the team is in love, it's unbearable. He always sings for so many meal. And then he comes, <laughs> you know, and, and, then, uh, and then this this is what the standard comedian is doing. Nothing else than that. So he he, he goes through the fourth wall and and talks uh, immediate to the to the public, to the audience. And that's uh, and that's that's true. You find it in British village, and you will find so many links to to the comedian in comic strips, in in television, in, in opera. This is one thing. That's one truth. Of our society, and then then we do meaningful work, and that's that's so important. Also, to ask the question: Is he a ranger or is he? One? Yeah, that, that's very very intelligent, because that's that's how how these stories become important for for, for us. starts at 7, but uh, you'll be getting a message from John that I, I want everybody here at 6.30 because you're going to get a tutorial from the costume designer about her